beloveds of the Lord. I am so blessed to be with you tonight and welcome to Generation Impact School of Prayer. I'm Amanda LaRue. We are in session 11 and we are talking about the phenomenal prayer that Jesus prayed and the longest prayer recorded in John 17. So last week I shared on how Jesus prayed for himself and dimensions of his prayer for himself. Tonight we are talking about the prayer that Jesus prayed for the disciples. It is the part two of his prayer in John 17 verse 6 to 19. So, um, family, this is the final prayer for uh, that Jesus prayed for his disciples and maybe perhaps the most significant prayer he prayed for them. And um, we can say that this prayer, the prayer in John 17 and then also the part that he prayed for his disciples is a model of Jesus' intercessory prayer as high priest before Father God. So it lays out why Jesus came to earth, what his ministry was all about, why the 12 disciples were special to him, the coming end of his earthly ministry, and it also um, explains the, the desire that Jesus had um, that the, his ministry would continue through the disciples and the church until he come to fetch us as a victorious church and, a, and his bride. So the prayer ended his ministry in the most critical hour right before uh, he would face the cross. We know that. So um, as Jesus prayed for the disciples, he looked beyond humili the humiliation he would go through, beyond the suffering and the betrayal, because he already knew that Judas um, was on his way to set up a trap for the betrayal of Jesus. He looked beyond the trauma his mother and his friends would endure, you know, as they uh, looked unto him on the cross and what he was going to go through. He looked beyond the trauma that he would go through to be obedient to death as he would accomplish his calling on earth and give birth to the New Testament church, to his ecclesia, us. As the church of the Lord. Jesus looked behind that in the, in the second part of his prayer as he started to pray for his disciples. So in your notes 2.1 we say firstly Jesus talks about his mission among the disciples as he poured out his heart in conversation with Father God in John 17 verse 9 to 10. And the word says, I am praying for them. I am not praying, requesting for the world, but for those you have given me, for they belong to you. So Jesus is very precise and he, he, he uh, reveals to Father for whom he is praying. And, and that it is for his disciple he's praying. He's now not praying for the world. In verse 10, the word says, All things um, that are mine are yours, and all things that are yours belongs to me. He, he reveals that he understands he's an heir in, in the Lord, that, that, he, that he is a son of God. He has sonship. And that whatever dad owns is also his property, belongs to him. And then in the second part of verse 10, he says, I am and I am glorified through them. And um, they have done my, me honor in them. My glory is achieved. So, um, yeah, we need to take note that there is no clear request in these two verses, but only statements as Jesus continues his conversation through prayer with Father God. You know, this is such an intimate 
um, time that was recorded between Jesus, his prayer requests, his, his conversation with Father concerning the disciples in the Bible, a very precious time, um, intimate fellowship between him and Father God. So in John 17, we see that a very good mixture between prayer and conversation. And um, there are times where Jesus asks God to do things, where he requests God to do things, and then there uh, there's times where he's just communing with the Lord, where he's just talking to him, and where he gives his point of view of what he, as a son, you know, that became flesh, has accomplished on the earth. So he was speaking to God as a son would speak to his father. And Jesus was sharing his heart with Father, his confidence that he accomplished everything that Father required to, to um, you know, him to do and requested him to do. So um, Jesus took time to communicate with his Father just before the last hour has arrived, before he would uh, face the cross. And um, family, we should do the same. So if we can, uh, how can we apply the two verses in our own lives? Uh, so we need to grow in our relationship with Father, in our communication with Father, in our trust uh, relationship with Father. The second thing is um, our conversation with God is a very essential part of our prayers and we often neglect our, um, you know, the relational side of prayer. So we need to come before God, acknowledge where we have failed Him and um, repent and restore in His presence. That's what Acts 3, 19 says. You can go and read. So prayer is not all about asking God to do things, but it we need to balance our prayer requests between, um, yeah, yeah, well, let me say it this way. We need to balance our prayer between request and conversation with Father God. So point 2.2 2 says, Jesus continues with his request to Father on behalf of the disciples that Father would keep them in his name, that they may be one as Father Son and Holy Spirit are one, as a trinity are one. So um, John 17 verse 11 to 12 says, And now I am no more in the world, but these are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father, keep in your name, in the knowledge of yourself, those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. This is so powerful and such an important prayer to take note of. So um, in verse 12, the word says, While I was with them, I kept and preserved them in your name. Jesus preserved the disciples in the name of the Father, in the knowledge and worship of you. Those you have given me, I guarded and protected, and not one of them has perished or lost except the son of perdition, Judas Iscariot, the one who is now doomed to destruction, destined to be lost, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. So Jesus was praying only for the 11 disciples. At this stage, Judas already left him and went off to set up the trap to betray Jesus. So maybe we can ask, why did Jesus request Father to keep them? So Jesus knew that the discipleship school with him was soon to come to an end and that they will need to be kept by God. So he requested it from God to keep him. Jesus knew that he was 
acted like a protection as the one who mentored them, as the one who discipled them. His prayers was like a protection to the disciples and that soon he won't be on the earth to pray for them though his intercession as we said many times is still continuing in heaven. Secondly, Jesus knew that they would soon face the biggest crisis in their lives ever, facing the cross, seeing what is happening to Jesus, also the fear they would experience and the, the tendency to run away, to go and hide, even not to be a witness at the cross. Jesus knew they will need to be kept by Father. So Jesus knew he would soon no longer be with him. Also traumatic because maybe in their hearts they thought he's going to be an earthly king. And they still did not believe he will depart, he will go. Or maybe they did not have intimate knowledge that he will have to go. So he could give us the Holy Spirit that he promised after his resurrection. So lastly, he prayed that Father would keep those he has given to Jesus and be one as the Father and the Son. So Jesus knew that they will need unity to stand, unity to fulfill their calling and their mandate on earth. And the unity with each other and with Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And Jesus asked Father to take over to keep them. So how do we apply the two scriptures in our prayer life? We should continually pray the prayers that Jesus prayed, that the Father would keep the disciples and it's us today. We are the disciples of the Lord today and we already came to, to salvation through the preaching of the gospel and we will look at the prayers that Jesus prayed for us as well in, the, in session 3 next week. So, um, Jesus, we should pray for each other from falling away from Jesus or from, yeah, from, from, from our faith, actually, so that we may be one as He and Father are one. And falling also away in temp the temptation to, to, to be divided and um, not find our unity in the word of the Lord and the truth of the word. So this prayer is genuinely relevant for us today. Don't you think so, family? Um, when we look around us, we see all the division. We see all the different factions in the church, all the denominations. We should pray that God unite us again. We need to be kept from the vision. We need, and in the third session, I will elaborate on the prayer that Jesus prayed for unity. So we need his help to keep us from error and sin. There are many, many opportunities, as we know, to step into a trap that the evil one sets for us, God's people, to be lured away and to be drawn into error. One of the big errors that we should deal with family is offense. Offense opens us for a spirit of death, spiritual death. And the moment we open for spiritual death, you know what is happening? You know, then um, we can't hear from God anymore. We can't preach an accurate word. In other words, we cannot present the gospel without twisting the gospel, so we need to pray for each other as God's disciples. We need to pray to be kept from hypocrisy. This is something that will forever knock on our doors and we need to be careful of that. 2.3 says, Jesus prayed that their joy might be made full. So Jesus elaborates on the request in verse 13 and 14 as he desires that, that, that his joy, the joy in him may be made full, complete and perfect in his disciples. And what was this joy? Just before I read um, verse 13 and 14, the Lord says that it was with joy that he endured the, um, uh, um, what do you say? Ach, jene nou verontgaan het my. Suffering, 
the joy of suf to the suffering because he knew that through his suffering a whole new church, a new testament would be um, born. So he wants us to understand his joy, why he was looking forward to the cross of Calvary and why he was looking forward to his suffering. And the word of God says we should suffer with Christ. So in verse 13 and 14, um, we read that, And now I am coming to you, I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that my joy may be made full and complete and perfect in them, that they may experience my delight full, fulfilled in them, my delight fulfilled in them, that my enjoyment may be perfected in their own souls, that they may have my gladness within them, filling their hearts. Oh my word, this is so powerful. Verse 14 says, I have given and delivered to them your messages, message and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, do not belong to the world, just as I am not of the world. So Jesus said that um, my joy may be made full and complete and perfected in them. And you see that for him, it was very important that we as his disciples will have a clear, full revelation of the cross work of Jesus, of the suffering he went through, the purpose of the suffering, the, the, what he would bear through his suffering, and that we would also understand that it was with joy that he was looking forward. Joy, he went to the cross. Why? Because he fulfilled the purposes of Father God. He fulfilled the requirements that would quench the wrath of God. And also that would bring to fulfillment the love of God. To see an unsaved world, a broken world saved and healed and he wants us to experience that he wants us to be carriers of the joy so how to apply this to our prayer life we should continually ask god that his joy may be made full and complete in us as we receive an a, the, a revelation of what he did why he did it and we take up our position in jesus because he has raised us from dead, the dead with the same authority and power establish us in him who is the word in heavenly places. So 2.4 says Jesus again asked Father to keep and protect them from the evil one while they are in the world. So John 17 it's, uh, verse 15 to 17 is amazing. The word says, I do not ask that you will take them out of the world. It's not the will of God that we will, you know, just leave this earth, but that you will keep and protect them from the evil one. So he wants us to overcome evil. He wants us to understand that it is the presence of God that keeps and protects, protects us. Verse 16 says, They are not of this world, worldly, belonging to the world, just as I am not of this world. So let's just look at the application for the two verses, verse 15 and 16. And, and the word says, We should ask God to keep and protect us. You see, um, uh, we should ask God to do exactly the same. Um, and we also should pray that, that the Lord will keep his disciples, his worldwide church, the disciples of God from the evil one. Family, we should take time out to really pray for the church, for the ecclesia, to pray for each other and um, just to come in behind each other's backs. Um, we need to lock our faith shield in prayer for each other. And also, we need to lock our faith shields in prayer for, for the disciples worldwide. As I said, but the Lord has opened the door for us on Zoom. We can 
become very, very easily, we can become part of Zoom meetings where we pray for the international prayer warriors, pray for the church, for the church to stand, for the church to stand against evil, against heresies, against error, against sin, against whatever. So we can easily join forces internationally with the prayer warriors of the Lord and pray for the church. So we can do what Jesus did in the second part of John 17. 2.5 says Jesus is putting in his next request for the disciples for God to sanctify them with the truth. So John 17 verse 17 to 19 says sanctify them, purify, consecrate, separate them for yourself, make them holy by the truth. Your word is the truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And so for their sake and on their behalf, I sanctify, dedicate, consecrate myself that they also might be sanctified, dedicated, consecrated, made holy in the truth. And we know Jesus asked us to follow in his footsteps. As a man, he had to set an example for us. He had to go through everything that he would require us to go through. And purification, sanctification, consecration, creation, to be set apart for God is an integral part of the prayer he prayed for his disciples. It should become an integral part for in our prayer life for how we pray for, for ourselves and also how we pray for the disciples of the Lord. And it should be an absolute desire in our hearts to be a dedicated, consecrated, holy priesthood unto God. So um, we see that Jesus prayed that the Father would keep them, that his disciples, um, you know, and keep them in the truth. So I want to say something about the truth um, as we still have a few minutes left. You know, family, we have a phenomenal armor in Ephesians 6. And the word of God says we should be dressed up in our armor. It is absolutely you know, the most powerful um, dress code, I would say, that God could ever give us is His armor. And the, the ability to walk in a lifestyle where we are clothed with the armor of God. It's a lifestyle. So it is not a thing like in the old days when I grew up. They said to us, go and stand in front of the mirror on a daily basis. And then you put on the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth and the, uh, the shield, you know, that would quench the fiery darts of Satan and the sword of the Spirit, and the, which is the Word of God, and the shoes to preach the gospel of peace and on the end to pray in the Spirit and, and also, you know, to pray for each other. Um, but it is a lifestyle of being clothed with the armor of God. So the Lord prayed in this prayer and he said to them, he asked Father that they also might be sanctified, dedicated, consecrated, made holy in truth. So the belt of truth is an integral part of our sanctification process. So many times, we can hook little lies onto the belt of truth. Now, I want to say the belt of truth supports your loyalty. It helps you to stand. When we read in Ephesians 6, the word says, when you have done everything, therefore stand. Take your stand and keep dominion is what it means. The belt of truth supports the loyalty of God's disciples, of God's people. It gives you the strength you need to keep your dominion as you stand on the truth 
and stand on the word of God, not giving one step back when the evil one come with his his um, opposition. You know, when he sends his giants to us, when he sends the the whatever. You know, you know, so many things can be sent to us. But the Lord says, once we have done everything, that was to pray, that was to declare, stand, keep dominion. Covered, clothed with the super armor of the Lord. Now, if we hook um, little lies on the belt of truth, the belt will weigh you down. It will not support your loins. It will not be a support to help you to sanctify and dedicate and concentrate, con- uh, consecrate yourself as a holy priest unto the Lord. One of the things that Jesus trusted Father to do was to keep the disciples from false or half-truths or a mixture, truth and lies mixed. It's important that we will see God and that we will come before him as we apply this part of the prayer that Jesus prayed for his disciples. And come before God and ask God, God, we, what area in my life needs sanctification? Where is the little lies that came and mixed with the truth of the word of God, deceiving me and hindering me from being a set apart holy priest unto you? And it's up to us to, to, to take time out. It is not any pastor or any reverence uh, responsibility to make sure that you live a sanctified, set-apart life. This should be part of our prayer life on a daily basis. And also, as we live in victory, we should desire that all God's disciples will be healed. They will be really healed a whole spirit, soul, and body. Therefore, we should take time out, like Jesus, to pray with him because he's still interceding for us. Pray with him and trust Father God to come and strengthen his church, to call them back to a place of holiness, a place of purity. You know, the word of God says, God is a holy God. Therefore, you need to be holy. You, my church, we, the church, the ecclesia, we, the disciples, need to live holy lives. And it is possible, family of God. So, um, as I come to a close, I just want to thank you for being zealous to learn more about prayer. And, And I want to pray, Father, I pray tonight like Jesus has prayed for the disciples. I pray for the, your disciples tonight, Father. Each and every one of us watching right now. Um, Father, I pray that you will come and sanctify us just as Jesus has sanctified himself for our behalf. Just as Jesus has set himself apart as a man, as a second Adam, to to, to uh, yeah, to make a way for us to become the door for us to walk into a place of holiness, a place of consecration, a place where we are set apart for the purposes and the calling of God on our lives. Father, I pray that you bless every home tonight with your shalom. Father, that every marriage will experience shalom healing in every dimension. Father, I just speak healing over the marriages of your disciples tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, I break that stronghold of disunity. I break that stronghold that works against the covenant of God's disciples with him in marriage, in church life, on in every dimension. And I pray, Father, unite us as you And Jesus and Holy Spirit are one. In Jesus' name. Thank you, beloved family of God. May the Lord bless and keep you. And see you next week.